Today we're going to talk about these figurines and the interpretations of archaeological artifacts. Uh, we're going to be dealing with an article by April Nowell and Melanie Chang called Science, the Media, and Interpretations of Upper Paleolithic Figurines, which gets referenced in Muckle, Gonzalez, and Camp on page 126 in the text box, the title of which mentioned in the last class, Upper Paleolithic Figurines. There it is again, not just erotica. I should really say not erotica. But the first question is why were they assumed to be erotica in the first place? Here they have been dug up and removed from the places in which they were found, cleaned up, and put on museum displays. They're sometimes shown in art history as the first instances of art. And then people get all excited about figurine proportions and start talking about them as erotica. And one of the reasons why I think this happens is because they are assumed to come from a phase of life in human society in which we have labeled it to be a phase before agriculture in this time from 40,000 to 9,000 years ago in Eurasia, from what is now France to what is now Siberia. Um, in which we imagined that the world was dominated by man the hunter. And so if the world was dominated by man the hunter, then the idea is that these were man the hunter's primitive porn objects. So the first thing I want to do is go into some reassessments of man the hunter, things that we've realized over the last bit of time. First of all, we have realized the importance of woman the gatherer in almost all of these early groups. So in many of the groups that we know of today that are hunters and gatherers, that is to say that they get their primary calories from both hunting and gathering. It is the women of the group which provide most of, around 70% of the cal daily calorie intake for the group. And so hunting is something that is done, but is often something that brings home more occasional than steady calories. So one of the things that people have done is to talk about the importance of woman the gatherer, and as Muckle Gonzalez and Camp put it on page 129, their anthropologists know that there is no reason to believe men had any more important roles than women in the past. So that's one of the ways in which the idea of man the hunter has been reassessed. Also, we should just note that while men are out, if, they, if it is the men that are out hunting, men also might be gathering as they hunt, especially if the hunt is not successful, or if the men are older or younger or not in the hunting mood, they might be gathering for their calories. And that women hunt as well. Now, there have been because of the way perhaps contemporary hunting takes place, there has been this idea that women would not be necessarily involved in hunting, but there are lots of different ways in which hunting took place in the past. One of them is through the use of nets. As I mentioned in the last class, there's a hunting often is a, not about the big mammals, but about small animals as well. And so women might've been involved in are definitely were involved in the production as well as the uh, the nets. A lot of what we call hunting is done with snares or traps. 
or getting having people surround animals and drive them off a, a ravine, probably not a huge cliff because you don't want them to fall too far to the bottom. But there's all kinds of different hunting techniques that people use, and many of these women could be involved in. And so there's been in the last 50 or 60 years, a reassessment of this idea that there was a definitive man the hunter phase. Now, some people have postulated that, that humans, Homo erectus and those types went through a long phase of not hunting, but scavenging in which they were in this context of the great African predators that humans or you know, people who, creatures who would become humans used those stone tools in order to run in after most stuff was, uh, most of the bones were, had been picked over by the, by the main predator and by other scavengers, that they would then use those stone tools to crack open bones and get especially the bone marrow. And so uh, some people have speculated that there was a, a long phase in which humans cooperated and had a period of scavenging. And on Muckle and Gonzalez and Camp on page 118, they are way against this or they do not think there is evidence to support this, at least the way I read them. My own feeling is that I have, I feel like there was a scavenging phase, but since your textbook says probably not, I'll just put a question mark by it and say, ah, I guess, I guess the evidence is leaning against it. There was a book that came out, about, this book came out in maybe in 2009, it called Man the Hunt Did change the R to an E. D at the end of it, primates, predators, and human evolution, which basically argued that many of the characteristics that we see about humans were caused not because we had man hunting, but man being hunted and having to cooperate in different groups. I don't think this book was that successful in part because if you just look at the title, there's a big old man there and they've just changed one little letter around. And so, you know, it doesn't really change our big ideas about things. So, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the ways in which we write our headlines and our titles and how we might redo that to better convey information. But in any case, we now don't talk about hunting societies because we know that these societies are always composed of both hunters and gatherers or hunting and gathering. And there's been a major shift in people's thinking, both in the scientific community, I think also perhaps in popular culture, in part because of the popularity of the paleo diet, which we'll read about in the next section, but there's been a major rethinking of what it was like to be a hunter-gatherer and what it, how we should interpret this phase. One of the things that we know now is that there wasn't just one way of hunting and gathering, that there was, in the ways in which people spread out all over the habitable world, you had to use different kinds of techniques and in different kinds of habitats. And it became a very successful subsistence strategy, uh, a sustainable strategy and one that people used in many different places and was, was working for uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years in some cases, um, not an unchanging strategy, but one in which people had to have deep ecological knowledge of their environment and be very invested in the place in which they were. We also know now that the, the technological apparatus for hunting and gathering was a lot more sophisticated than we once thought. We used to think that the tools of hunters and gatherers were incredibly simple, but we now know as that box on 
deconstructing cavemen and cave women and Muckle and Gonzalez 128 to 129, that it's actually very difficult to make a lot of the tools, the stone tools and other tools that were used. And in, by some measures, the things that you need to hunt and gather, especially large mammals, are are more complicated than the tools that you would you have used for some of the first horticulture or agriculture, which may be as simple as a digging stick and in some ways not be as technically sophisticated as the uh, hunting and gathering techniques. As I said, we also know that they were not simply uh, harvesting what we might call, and yes, they're dealing with what we call wild plants and animals, but they had a they had and have a deep, it takes a deep knowledge of your environment in order to do this. And in some ways, uh, people have started to talk about how they were actually actively managing their environments. Uh, in some cases using fire not simply as a something to cook with on a small scale, but as on a large scale to burn off large areas in order to encourage the growth of the favorable plants and animals that would that are that they would like to hunt and gather. So a lot of the landscapes that we see uh, or we saw even in uh, in the Americas when the Europeans. Uh, first arrived were extensively shaped by the people who had lived there in ways that the Europeans did not understand because they were using these sort of large scale techniques to transform the landscape. We've talked about the importance of women in these groups and the gathering of calories, but especially in the last 10 years or so, there's been a realization that perhaps this isn't simply just men the hunter, woman the gatherer, and that gender, the gender divide was as deep and ancient as we once thought it was. And this is something that we're, again, just only now coming to terms with, um, in part because uh, we're figuring out some stuff about our own gender ideas, but we're also starting to rethink how artifacts are interpreted in the past. So like I said, this has been something that's been going on, I would say, since the, since the 1960s and 1970s, perhaps at around the same time that we had some of those bipedal revolution ideas and, you know, that, that reshape the the functioning of human evolution also was a reshaping of our ideas about hunters and gatherers. For me, one of the beautiful culminating articles about this and about the figurines, which I used to assign uh, in class and sometimes I still do, was a great article called New Women of the Ice Age. It's much easier to read than this article because it was in Discover magazine, and so it was a more popular, popular, uh, popularly written article by a science journalist, and it was written back in 1998, and it talked about these figurines again, 1998. None of you were even born then, right? You were all born past 2000. Anybody born before 2000? As I sometimes say, your parents could have read this article. I'm teaching this article for 20 years. Basically, what Heather Pringle was talking about was the same figurines, the upper Paleolithic figurines. And one of the speculations was that the reason they were the way they were is they that they were used in, in rituals of prophecy and divination and reading the future. And this is mentioned briefly in uh, Nal and Chang on page 570 that they could have been used for divination. Uh, 
Um, it's again a, a sort of a speculative idea, but it was a cool idea because what they found out is when they tried to remake some of these figurines, they noticed that a lot of them had been um, at where it seemed to be in pieces, and that perhaps uh, the ones that they found intact were kind of not necessarily the main reason people had the women had made these figurines. That if you if you recreated them. Uh, they would explode them in the fire, and by finding out where the pieces went, the shards or the cracks or the lines, in the same way that we have palm readings of lines, you could you could tell the future. And they also use what is called uh, ethnographic analogy, and and looking at some of the hunter gatherer groups in contemporary ways that have a similar practices and kind of interpreting them back onto the past. So a really interesting idea about how some of the figurines might have been used. There was another interesting speculation, which also Nal and Chang uh, mentioned, which is that if you look at some of these figurines from the top down, the, the body perspective on these actually looks like it is a woman looking at her own body uh, in various stages of pregnancy. And so some people have said that they seem to perhaps have had a medical or a purpose in understanding pregnancy and reproduction. Um, and that explains some of the sometimes uh, strange angles that you see or you know shapes that, you, that would be different from, uh, from what we what we look at it head on. And there's been an article written that, that, that actually argues this point quite well. Um, but, um, but from this article, what we were very sure that they were not, as Heather Pringle put it, poor females waiting at home for these guys to bring home the bacon. We were very sure that they weren't primitive porn. And in my favorite part of this article, Jim Adovasio, the archaeologist, just says, "What crap!" Which is like, why, why would he? Why would we even think that anymore? So I love this article. Like I said, it could have been read by your parents back when they were in college, back in the day. And so I figured when I used to teach this article, and I still do, it was well written and a popular thing that we had it all wrapped up. No reason to, it's not that we knew exactly what was going on, but we knew what was not going on. It was the whole idea that this was like, you know, primitive porn. And so the question from this article, though, which was written in 2014 by Nao and Chang, Oh, I guess I should have said that's my abbreviation for them, NNC, as opposed to MGC, which is our textbook authors, Michael Gonzalez and Camp. So this is Nell and Chang. The question is, why is it that we're still dealing with these interpretations, as they put it, despite decades of reflexive critiques? When eight, when um. Heather Pringle wrote that article in 1998 for Discover that was already based on, you know, a lot of criticism and critique of the idea that these were erotica. Kaz, I thought you had a similar reaction. Like, why? Why is this still going on? It's very frustrating, right? It's like, what? Why, do, why is this still happening? Yeah, I agree. It's very frustrating. So... One of the reasons, though, one of the reasons, I think that sometimes good scientists are sometimes unable to get their points across is that we spend a lot of time critiquing things, but not headlining what we want to say. So this has come up in the idea of what, what you need to do is make a, what um, the linguist Lakoff calls a truth sandwich. The problem with academics is they're always critiquing something instead of 
telling us the truth. And so you're supposed to say the truth first, and then the lie, and then the truth again. That's why he calls it a truth sandwich. And so what I wanted you to do in reading through this article was to look at these headlines and then to read the critique. But one of my issues with this article is that if you just read the headlines, these bolded parts, you might come to exactly the wrong conclusion. Kind of like the man, the hunted book. Like if you just look at the big word, it's man, which is not what they were trying to say, but you know, it still comes up there. So what I'm going to try to do is talk about the critique and then I'm going to try to retitle it in my own way for what I think they're, they should have said or they sh we should be saying in today's world. Let's start with this one. The first one, Venus figurines were made by men for men. True, Alex? False. <laughs> Why? could be made by anybody yeah and in fact in other cave art it's hard to tell who makes things but we have evidence that many people were involved so here's my here's my better headline for you which is that women make stone tools as we learned in the last class we know that they do it in today's society and they make art this is not just something that men do women do it too so they can we don't know that they were doing it but we know it can be done we know it is done so only men are aroused by visual stimuli cass True? Very much not true. Yeah, very much not true. It's probably too early in the morning for many of these statements. And in my crude way, I'm just going to say this, that you know, when you look at porn, or when you don't, when not when you look at porn, when you look at who looks at porn, it turns out that this is something that women like too. People were just afraid to tell the researchers that back in the 1950s and 60s. <laughs> Speaking of something that is, oh no, this is, we can talk about this. Actually, nobody. And that I know of, nobody chose this headline. All of the figurines are the same. This is a little more complicated uh, because the assumption was that they followed a certain pattern in terms of their curviness. And um, what we see when we look at various figurines is that there's all kinds of body shapes and what are called waist to hip ratios. So the original idea was what they had these sort of waist to hip ratios, which were sexy for primitive guys. But it turns out there's all kinds of body shapes being represented and represented. And there's not there's not one particular waist to hip ratio, which is biologically favored or the same. This picture is what's too early in the morning for. What's that? What is it titled? Oh, yeah, because they decided that it should be this way. <laughs> so in the museum, it's like, hey, that must be a rod with breasts. That's a female, obviously. 
is not the other thing if you put it the other way or you put it sideways. It's not, you know, it's not that. It couldn't be that because, wait a second, what headline are we dealing with here? Ariana's headline. All of the figurines are female. What do you say, Ariane? No. <laughs> Some of the figurines are male. Some of them are other world creatures. Some of them could be other things. We tend to put them in museums in certain ways and give them titles, but nobody told us to do that. We just did it. Paleolithic systems of meaning recognized only two genders. Delaney, what do you say about that? That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Yeah. I think we can be pretty clear that it, that ancient gender systems were not simply a projection of the binary that we believed in into the past. Don't write this next part down. This is more for me. If you go back, oh wait, if you go to, if you go to Muckle and Gonzalez and Camp on page 122, no, 120, they talk about the division of labor based on sex for close to 2 million years. And in the old version of this, when it was simply Muckle and Gonzalez back in the second edition, I had to put up there that I thought it they would, I hope that they would revise this. And hooray, I told them to revise it. And they did. In this edition, on page 120, they said, we recognize that a two-gender binary is overly simplistic. And as in the present, there were probably multiple genders. So... Yay, we got that one in there. Um, because in the like I said, in the old days, we used to talk about this ancient division of labor. And obviously there were divisions of labor, and some of them uh, are with us, but that doesn't mean that it was extended into the past in exactly the same form as the present. Christina. <laughs> Being unclothed is erotic. True or false? False. Yeah, not necessarily. In fact, I think better to say that the very definition of what people are going to count as erotic is going to vary both historically, what we in our own society thought was erotic 50 years ago, it's kind of a turn off now, and cross-culturally just because someone is showing or not having something covered up or doesn't mean it is counting or should be counted in the, in the spectrum of being erotic. So the question is, why is it that the, or one question we could ask, why do these man the hunter stereotypes endure? Why have they been so, so difficult to dislodge? And part of it, as we know, is that science is not is not unbiased, it's not, it's hopefully self-correcting, but it has been part of a sexist society as Michael Gonzalez and Camp tell us back on page 112, uh, a lot of the first people to look at these figurines were guys who interpreted them in a guy way. So that's part of the issue. There are some issues that are perhaps less um, I mean that one is is sort of an obvious bias but this one is less sexist in the sense that people I think no nobody wants to be a scavenger nobody wants to say that 
people were once hunted. That sounds yucky. And so, you know, I mean, I think people wanted to glorify the idea of human achievement and hunting seems like a man, the hunter seems like a, a way of glorifying human achievement. The other thing that happens in, uh, in the ethnographic evidence is that even if your hunting doesn't give you a lot of the calories on a daily basis, it's often more exciting to talk about the stories of pursuing large game animals. So this might only happen once a month or once every 10 years, but boy, everybody's gonna hear about it. Whereas the nuts and berries and tubers that people collect are not usually part of the folklore. They don't usually talk about that in the, the glorified way that they have. We talked about this in the last class in terms of the archeological evidence it's often very difficult to get the evidence of small boned animals, of nets that might have been used for net hunting. Uh, these things can be sometimes reconstructed, but uh, some archeologists, I think Michael Gonzalez and Camp discussed this later on, they sometimes have eaten small animals and seeing how much is left after you eat it and you basically come up with none like no archaeological evidence uh, is in the record so what lasts longer are those larger boned animals things like you know uh, stone hunting points um, and the depictions of those kinds of things tend to endure and so we see evidence of those um, and then we interpret the past in that way. The other thing I think, and Michael, I mean, now and Chang discussed this a little bit uh, on pages 570 to 571, where they're talking about why does the Venus hypothesis have such staying power, is that people in general like to have an explanation. They want to know why things happen. I think we talked about this a little bit in the last class when when we talked about at what point do you just say we don't know? People don't like to hear we don't know, right? They want to hear what it was for. Why did they do this? And so they don't like being told, well, it might have been for, uh, you know, divination or it might have been for reproduction, but it's not really clear. That's just not fun. It's funner to say, like, it's this or it's that. And, you know, people don't like to have all this complexity around. And so there's probably multiple reasons. That in, and in different societies, there were different ways of interpreting them. Um, and so sometimes it's difficult to, to convey that message, especially in a headline. The thing that kind of depresses me, though, going back to... <laughs> Perhaps the first point is that I think in the last few years, there's actually been a backlash against uh, some of these reinterpretations. You may know this from looking around the political scene and seeing all those people getting all upset about something that nobody even knew existed, critical race theory. Um, you know, it's like... There's been this huge backlash, and so if anybody says anything that might be considered politically progressive, they're accused of interpreting this and being too woke and being this and being that. And so, you know, there are people that just don't want to change. And as Muckle Gonzalez and Camp put it, uh, when they talk about, hey, a lot of archaeologists are trying to change their terminology, they say the traditional vocabulary remains the norm in the early decades of the 21st century. So it's still pretty much the norm. And there's actually, at least in my view, I, I believe I'm seeing more of a backlash whenever anybody tries to do anything that uh, reinterprets the past uh, in ways that are that are non-traditional or more uh, more open-minded, you might say. But at least it's there. At least we're trying, some of us. <laughs>